This is a bit of a weird video in my oeuvre. It's essentially my attempt to get you excited for AMC's upcoming show, The Terror, coming from AMC this October, which you'll be able to watch on AMC. This isn't a promotion or anything like that, though. <clears throat> AMC. But if they want to give me money for every time I, A, um, say their name, that's fine with me, AMC. The Terror is a horror show based on a novel of the same name by Dan Simmons and concerns the Franklin Expedition, the worst disaster in polar exploration. And I'm going to start with the basics of what we know happened. It's 1845 and the height of the UK's Victorian hubris, and the British have decided that going all the way around South America or Africa is a crap way to sail between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. And so send a mission to find the Northwest Passage, a seaway north of Canada. If it exists and it can be sailed, then there's suddenly a much faster trade route and it's all Britons. The ships are the HMS Erebus and Terror. You might think the Terror is a bad omen, but Erebus was the ancient Greek god of darkness and another word for Tartarus. The ancient Greek hell. Oh dear. But in their defense, both ships were repurposed warships. The ships were filled with the best tech the 1840s had to offer. Actual steam engines to assist the sails, several years worth of canned food, central heating, and everything they felt they'd need for years out in the ice. There were musical instruments, an automated piano, a library, and equipment to teach the sailors how to read and write. This was the most advanced expedition the early Victorians had ever launched. In command was the captain of the Erebus, former Lieutenant Governor of Tasmania, Rear Admiral Sir John Franklin. An aging polar veteran nicknamed the man who ate his own boots after nearly starving in the Arctic. He was looking for a glorious end to his long career. Under him was the hyper competent captain of the Terror, Francis Crozier. Member of the Royal Society, the most prestigious scientific organization of the day, probably the second most experienced polar explorer of his day, Crozier likely would have been in overall command if he'd not committed the twin crimes of being Irish and lowborn. Franklin second on the Erebus, Commander James Fitzjames, was an officer with an almost ridiculous reputation for heroism and daring in military campaigns, and even once saved a drowning sailor. He was a highborn bastard with a lot to prove. There were over 130 men. Apart from the sailors, there was a battalion of Royal Marines, for manual labour and in case of polar bears or angry Inuit. Plus, they were sailing into uncharted territory, so better safe than sorry. It all sounds great, except out of the 130 plus men, not many had polar experience. Literally seven of the officers did. Franklin, Crozier, the ship's ice masters, and three others. And one of them once did a season aboard a whaling ship. The crews were picked by Fitzjames, who mainly chose from many served within campaigns much near the tropics. Crozier, who was a legend of Arctic and Antarctic exploration, Crozier, who had cut his teeth as second-in-command to Sir James Ross, the greatest polar explorer of the age, Crozier, who had survived Arctic disaster and been as close to both poles as was feasible at the time, was allowed to pick one man. His personal valet. Man, being Irish and lowborn sucks. I have no idea if things would have been different if Crozier had been able to choose two crews of hardened polar veterans, but I doubt what happened could have gone any worse but I'm getting ahead of myself. The ships left England in May 1845 and stopped off at Greenland, where five of the men were discharged, and the remaining crew were able to send final letters home. One of those became hideously ironic, as it expressed the hope that they spend at least one winter trapped in the ice. They then sailed for the Arctic and were last seen by Europeans in summer 1845. We know they spent the first winter icebound at Beachy Island in the Canadian Arctic, where three men died. A few deaths weren't unexpected, but not that early in the journey. The next winter they were icebound again at King William Island, a desolate beach of shingles and a lot of ice. Franklin filled out an admiralty record form, giving an update on their progress, which was placed in a sealed box inside a message cairn. All was well. A message cairn was a short tower of rocks that couldn't be mistaken for natural formation, which polar explorers would leave messages for those who came after them, whether they be other travellers or search parties. Now, the only problem with this system is that the Inuit knew the cairns contained metal, and metal is precious in the Arctic. So often they were looted and the messages were lost. It is possibly why this, and a copy, are the only messages we have from the expedition. Another possibility is that Franklin didn't like leaving message cairns. He didn't leave one at Beachy, for instance. Nearly a year afterwards, the box was reopened and Fitzjames scrawled a new message on the edges. Franklin dead. Nine officers dead. Fifteen men dead. Ships still stuck on the ice. Ships abandoned. All is not well. This message is the last piece of direct communication we have with the expedition. Everything from here is based on physical evidence and accounts by the Inuit. The years of the Franklin expedition were an unusually cold period, and the Arctic basically missed spring and summer for several years running. And now in command, Captain Crozier decided to walk south, through Canada to the Hudson Bay Company. Now, the British decided to ignore the Inuit on the one subject that any sane person would accept that they knew quite a lot about. How to survive in the Arctic. So they didn't bring sledges, dogs, or much in the way of skins to wear. 
The lifeboats were taken from the ships, filled with supplies, and turned into makeshift sledges, which were then pulled by the sailors. The voyage didn't expect to have to travel over land, so they had to create their own snowshoes. Now, a documentary decided to recreate this attempt, and under ideal circumstances, with fit young men, they were able to manhaul a boat for about four miles in a day. But the crews were not under ideal circumstances. The men were probably suffering from hypothermia, frostbite, and starvation. They were definitely suffering from scurvy. You see, they brought years worth of lemon juice with them, but they didn't realize that vitamin C in lemon juice degrades over time. They had years worth of food on board, and with men dying, surely there should have been enough. Well, here's the thing. The same man who provided the canned food for the Franklin expedition did it for other British ships, and they were apparently full of botulism from improper canning. Some had chunks of bone to bring them up to weight, some were clearly rotten, and, this is my personal favourite, some were filled with rocks. So there was probably starvation too. But that's not all. Remember those three bodies on Beachy Island? Well, they were dug up and autopsied in the 80s, and you might want to look away in three, two, one. Amazing how being buried in a literal permafrost can do wonders for your decomposition. Anyway, they were found to have a crazy high amount of lead in them. Victorian England had a lot of lead, but nothing like this. Lead is poisonous, but it takes a lot and a long time to actually kill you, but one thing it does do is make you weaker, emaciated, and more susceptible to other things, like tuberculosis or pneumonia. So, where'd the lead come from? Well, the cans were sealed with lead solder, and the lead leaches into acidic food and tastes sweet. So every bite of food that didn't make them sick made them weaker. One other thing that lead does is mess with your mind. It addles your thoughts. Enough of it will literally make you stupider or crazy. This might explain why the boats they pulled were full of possibly useless items. I say possibly because while the items might seem useless to us, stuff like curtain rods and novels and silverware, I've seen people with more degrees in this than me make cases for most of the stuff they brought, so I don't know. So they walked south, and we don't know too much, but we do know that the crew split into smaller bands at some point. Some gave up and headed back to the ships to either try and sail them out or to die in something like comfort. An Inuit told a tale of finding one of the ships going on board and being accosted by men with black faces who were screaming at him until an officer told them to let him go. The officer then told him never to let his people come anywhere near the ship. The black faces were likely scurvy, but I've seen a theory that the men could have been trying to distract themselves in the last days by reenacting a minstrel show, which apparently was a common entertainment on ships at the time. And the screaming could have been excitement because they thought they'd been rescued. Elsewhere, the Inuit told tales of tents filled with corpses and white men eating their dead in desperation. This didn't go down well in Victorian England, where the media and upper classes decided the Inuit probably killed them and lied about it. Charles Dickens, yes, that Charles Dickens, notable Inuit hater, even co-wrote a play called The Frozen Deep, which insulted the Inuit and John Ray, the searcher who told them about what the Inuit had seen. Of course, since then, bones have been found with knife marks, bones that were shattered to get to the marrow and skeletons missing their heads. The heads were possibly taken as a portable food source or removed so they didn't have to look at their friends' faces while they butchered them. About ten years later, on one side of King William Island, some searchers found something out of a gothic horror novel as they happened upon one of the lifeboats, filled with curtain rods, chocolate, books, and guarded by two skeletons, one fully clothed and armed with a loaded gun. And below the snow, a sea of bones. One of the later accounts tell of a band of men wintering with some Inuit, and afterwards their leader gifting them a sword. This sword was later traded to the Hudson Bay Company by the same band of Inuit. The last account of living men comes between 1850 and 1858. Allegedly, Crozier and at least one other man still walking south after more than five years in the ice in the Baker Lake area, about halfway down Nunavut, and never seen again. The last piece of physical evidence to be left was found in the Baker Lake area, what appeared to be a message cairn without a message inside, just some pieces of a hardwood box. It was found in 1948, so there may well have once been a message in a box there, almost a hundred years earlier. Now, the last sighting was less confirmed than the others, and there's nothing concrete to connect the 1948 cairn to the expedition. But stranger things have happened. The ships themselves have been found, the Erebus in 2014 and the Terror in 2016. Erebus is badly busted up, but Terror is apparently in amazing shape for 150 years at the bottom of the sea. That was the story of the Franklin expedition. There is so much more we don't know and never will know. It's a mystery. A massive jigsaw, we're missing most of it. We don't know exactly what's there, but we do know it's sad, and every new piece we find just makes it sadder. The Terror, coming soon to AMC, will roughly tell the same story I have, except... <laughs> except it adds a giant fucking demon bear. Now, if you've made it to the end of this video, can you honestly tell me that that hasn't grabbed your attention? Human suffering is nothing compared to the appeal of a giant fucking demon bear. It's a giant fucking demon bear.
No, you have to watch it. Seriously, it's a fascinating subject and I hope the show does it justice. If you want to know more, there's loads of books out there or just type Franklin Expedition into YouTube and you can find documentaries. Or check out Visions of the North, historian Russell Potter's site dedicated to the subject. 